All right, welcome everybody to Legal Tech Week for Friday, June seventeenth, two thousand and twenty-two. The uh, Juneteenth, I guess, sort of almost edition of this show, and uh, Father's Day and and Celtics victory, of course, uh, edition of, of this show as well. Uh, we wish. But uh, maybe not. Uh, but this is the show in which we talk about the top stories in uh, legal tech and legal innovation from the past week. I am Bob Ambrosi. I have a blog called Law Sites and a podcast called Law Next. And our panelists today are starting with Jean. You want to introduce yourself? Uh, yes, I am Jean O'Grady. I am the author of Dewey B Strategic, which covers legal information, knowledge, workflow. Uh, marketplace. And re more recently, I'm a, a monthly columnist at Legal Tech Hub. And uh, Joe. Uh, Joe Patrice from Above the Law and Thinking Like a Lawyer podcast. I am here um, it, because, you know, I, I, I don't, I don't know. I don't know. I really didn't come up. I, I'm almost never the this early in the rotation of you introducing people. So I usually have time <laughs> to figure out what my next thing's going to be. So I've got what nothing. What you say? I'm yeah. sorry, I'm disappointing everybody. Oh, God, caught you off guard. See, and I thought you were an impromptu kind of guy. But... Uh, all right, and uh, Zach? We are all on our A game here on this Friday. <laughs> hey, everybody. Friday. I'm Zach Warren, editor-in-chief of ALM's Legal Tech News. Um, you'll also find me on law.com, The American Lawyer, and other ALM brands. See, I, I'm not on my A game either because I was trying to think in my head of making some sort of connection between all the Celtics turnovers and legal tech, but it just wasn't coming to me. So I'll just say go Warriors. Yeah. All right. Uh, and our special guest joining us uh, today, uh, this time on purpose, as opposed to the last time he joined us when he just kind of aimlessly <laughs> wandered into our uh, discussion. Yeah. <laughs> Jeff. Well, my name's Jeff Brandt. I am the editor of the Pinhock Law Technology Digest. I also happen to be the chief information officer at Jackson Kelly. All right. Well, uh, we've got uh, we've got a few not quite as exciting of a week as we had last week. I think there was a lot of stuff to talk about last week, but uh, still stuff to talk about this week. And uh, honestly, there was a lot more that happened this week that I didn't even get to on my, my blog that I'm still hoping to write maybe over the weekend. Uh, but uh, we're going to kick off i think jeff your 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 uh your your sentient ai story because it then ties into another story we're going to talk about i think so why don't you tell us about that yeah so i was i was fascinated let me put a link here to everybody um basically um uh, google engineer claims that uh, one of their chat bots uh has a reach sentience of sorts uh, and so there's all kinds of questions on, you know, what do you do with sentient uh, AI? Uh, how do you treat it? Um, you know, what's uh, the ultimate ramifications of this? And I am way too much of a sci-fi nerd uh, to uh, to not say, okay, well, first thing we need to do is teach it how to play tic-tac-toe, right? Uh, for those of you that get the war games reference, but um, you know, it, it's fascinating to me that uh, we can come so far, and and I'm not uh, the articles and everything that I've read so far really doesn't give me enough to comment. Not that my ex area of expertise in AI is sufficient for me to judge whether it's sentient or not. But just the concept of you know a chatbot, and I believe that it was a fairly short time period, only uh, six months, eight months, something like that, that it achieves sentience, or, or again, this engineer believes it achieves sentience. Uh, and it's just, like I said, fascinating concept. Uh, we've had AIs that have been around longer. Uh, you know, is it truly sentient? Is it just, uh, you know, a well-received uh, uh, set of tools? Hard, hard to tell. But to me, it was a fascinating concept that, uh, you know, that this chatbot would truly have achieved sentience. And I got a couple of um, emails from readers saying, okay, well, you know, it is, it's, it's this whole thing now of, you know, if you're upgrading it, are you doing harm uh, to the sentience? You know, if you replace 1.0 AI with 1.1 AI, as, have you done harm? Have you caused pain? Have you caused suffering of some sort? And it's like, okay, well, I'm not sure I'm ready to handle or answer that particular question, especially not on a Friday at this point. 
So I, I was actually, so did, did Google claim it's sentient or did the guy who got fired claim it's sentient and Google's kind of taking issue with that? Because the, uh, that's the way I read it was to say, they're, they're, you know, they're either hushing him up, <laughs> uh, either they know something that they don't want uh, known, uh, or, or he knows something that, that they don't want known, because, because it was, yeah, it was kind of a, a whistle, like Josh, it was kind of like, he's, he's the whistleblower, right, Bl blowing the whistle yeah. on the fact that, uh, that uh, this AI has gotten a little too smart for its britches. So it's Hal, and it's going to take over the spaceship, right? <laughs> <laughs> right, or at least beat us a go, that's for sure. But yeah, I mean, clearly, uh, I believe the engineer was uh, reprimanded or terminated for sharing secrets, uh, you know, and so on. But yeah, it, it's clear that it's the engineer who thought it achieved sentience, and Google was kind of downplaying that whole idea and concept. Uh, yeah. But made a, a mad, uh, mad dash. It's uh, uh, Lambda, basically, a language model for dialogue applications. Uh, and again, simple chatbot, um, but talking about its loneliness and it's like, okay, well, you know, I've, everybody's got a disposition in life, I guess. If you're an AI on a shelf at, uh, at Google, uh, I guess you could be lonely as as well. Yeah, I so. I read a lot of the I read a lot of the transcript that this guy put out uh, of his and the he and another engineer were conducting this test, so that sometimes the other engineer is in this transcript and. Yeah, I, I, like it, it. It's describing feelings, but it's describing feelings in a way that, as I read it, I was I was pretty skeptical. I felt like it. Its job is to emulate kind of a human natural conversation, and it has been fed sufficient information that it can make contextual leaps. And it just kind of felt like when you're being asked, "How are you? How do you feel?" It was going it digging deep and being like joy is a thing that people feel and i understand that and he's like well what does that feel like to you and then it basically spit out a dictionary definition of joy and i was like well of course that that doesn't mean sentience necessarily as much as good engineering so yeah i don't know and it also reminded me there's that chat bot in well microsoft created a chat bot that went crazy a few years ago i don't know if anybody remembers tay but tay ai was their chat bot that uh they put out to the world and the world immediately made it into a racist <laughs> awful Train, thing. It in the wrong way. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so they shut it down. Weirdly, it got back online itself a week <laughs> later. That that's the part that actually scares me. And, but, it, was, and it was accompanied by Clippy that time, I think. <laughs> yeah. But but there's a corollary to that Microsoft one, there's a chat bot that was in Japan that went the kind of the route that this Lambda thing did. It went down the road of becoming very, expressing that it was very sad and lonely all the time. Uh, so it's not like it's new that these chatbots can get caught into emotional loops just based on what they decide they can say. Yeah. It's there, interesting. Uh, there's, uh, I had a conversation with an AI engineer this week uh, about a product. I'll be writing about it next week, but he was talking about his AI and, and also reminding me back about how they developed AlphaGo, but how they started through these different phases where at first they started training the, the AI to play Go and, and then they, they decided they won't train it. I guess they started training on the, on the rules and then let, just let it play and figure out how to get better. And then they just took, tried then the second version. They didn't even train it on the rules. They just let it start playing or something. And then eventually it got to this point where these, these two computers playing against each other without any training whatsoever. And they just figured out how to do it and, and, and how to, what kinds of strategies to employ. And, uh, this, the product I'll be writing about this week, they're kind of doing that for a, a legal tech uh, solution where they say that we've gotten to the point where we, we really don't even have to train it so much uh, as we've now got these two computers who, that are that are handling sort of different points of it and feeding off of each other and learning uh, without any kind of human training going on whatsoever. So that's I back, that's don't back understand to my, it at all, but it's fascinating. That's back to my tic-tac-toe example, right? That's how Joshua learned. Uh, was playing himself in tic-tac-toe. Right, right, yeah. So, uh, and, uh, yeah, um, and no, it's not that one, uh, Zach. Uh, <laughs> but uh, 
so sentient uh sentient ai and uh the gene has a story on uh, on perhaps uh, something else that that uh, has enough brains never to forget. So a story <laughs> this week in the New York Times about Happy the elephant, who is at the a um, the Bronx Zoo, which is very close to dear to my heart from my childhood. Uh, the uh, an organization called the Non Human Rights Project brought a suit against the Wildlife Conservation Society claiming that uh, Happy's habeas corpus rights were being violated. And it actually, now I'll explain this, it, in New York, the, the trial court is called the Supreme Court. So it started in the Supreme Court and Happy, or the, the, the uh, non-human rights project won in the, uh, in the trial court, but then it went up all the way up to the, this week to the highest court, the New York State Court of Appeals, and they denied it. and. Uh, they, I like this line. While no one disputes the impressive capabilities of elephants, we reject the petitioners' Those are arguments that, that he is entitled to, uh, they are entitled to habeas corpus on Happy's behalf. And one of the things they talk about is like that it would basically wreak havoc on our society because everybody would have to get rid of their dogs and nobody knew how far it would extend and could you have a parakeet. And uh, so I, I thought it was, I was, I, I don't know. It just, it surprised me even that it got as far as it got given the, the nature of the suit, but it got all the way to the high court in New York state. And then the New York Times article also notes that this is the first case of its kind in, an, in the English speaking world to reach the highest court in any jurisdiction. I'm, yeah, I'm thinking about that. That, that I mean, that, I, I don't think, yeah, there, there was the chimp case that made yeah. it to the New York Court of Appeals. I, I mean, it, it, yeah. it may be the first pachyderm related one, um, <laughs> which it, and actually and I that that's not to be flipped I that chimp case, because I remember I was covering that when it was happening. That was also the, brought by the non-human rights project, uh, non-human animal, whatever the name of it is. I always forget anyway, but it was also brought by them. And I I felt like that case, obviously, chimpanzees being way closer in relation to humans, that case, they, they did a good job of kind of, in that case, positioning themselves as the chimp deserves habeas rights, because like, unlike having a dog or something like that, like we can actually point to this thing, this thing is feeling things on a level that other animals aren't. And so they, they kind of had a built in backstop with that case. Uh, and it got rejected too. So when the elephant case came, I thought, well, if they can't win the they can't win the chimp. I don't think they're going to win this, but. Yeah, I, St Stephen Wise, the guy who founded that group, used to, in early in his career was based in Boston and, and way, way, way back when, when I was the editor of uh, Lawyers Weekly in Boston, his office was right next door to mine and he used to come over all the time and I got to know him a little bit. And uh, I, I have since read a bunch of his books uh, on this issue and uh, they're really, really good reads uh there's books like rattling the cage toward legal rights for animals drawing the line science in the case for animal rights uh but uh i mean it's a, it, there's a really compelling case i mean because the, i mean the science really backs up this idea that that you know i i mean animals are in fact sentient uh in in, in many ways and and capable of learning and having intelligence and uh you know, it, it, it's a troubling issue. Uh, I, I mean, it's it's interesting that somebody just put a comment in the chat, you know, kind of create an, uh, an analogy to uh, arguments made during colonial times toward uh, towards slaves. I, I, you know, there may be a time when we may look back uh, on this and uh, uh, I don't know, these were like the Plessy v. Ferguson's or something of, uh, of, of uh, animal cases. I don't know. That's a bad comparison, I guess, but uh, still, I think it's really fascinating. And I think the law will evolve on it, but not quite AI since they're already, they already yeah. exist. Well, yeah, I mean, and even the judge's opinion acknowledges that they're, and, and one of the reasons they sided with the, the zoo was the bonding between the animals and the, and the caretakers. Yeah, yeah. Uh, all right. Um, so since Joe has a drink to his mouth, I'm going to call on him next just to catch him off guard again. Sure. Well, we've got him off balance today, but yeah. uh, no. I, since we didn't get to your story last time, and we're we're uh, uh, here's your chance. 
Yeah, no. Um, so last time it it's you know tangentially um, tangentially related to uh, to tech. Uh, I it was a digital platform that kind of like inspired me to talk about this. But I arbitration and you know the the whole world of alternative dispute resolution is out there. It's not going away. The um, obviously the Supreme Court seems willing to shut off everyone's access to real courts. Uh, so we're probably going to need it, uh, even if it, it wasn't just because it's, you know, often cheaper and more efficient to get through than going to, to, you know, established courts. But, you know, it, it, all of this alternative dispute resolution still requires people to make those decisions. And I was talking with the folks when I was at Clock, I was talking with some folks from New Era who like are doing, uh, have a digital ADR platform. And I was just hearing a little bit about that, but we got into kind of the more philosophical discussion about who decides these arbitrations, you know? And one of the points that they made was, well, you know, one project we have is trying to diversify that pool of who neutrals are because we have kind of been asleep at the switch as a legal community because as the legal community expands the use of these alternative methods we've kind of just shrugged and said retired practitioners uh you guys get to do it uh and by you guys i mean mostly guys and mostly white mostly white old guys who are retired uh, is a large part of that pool, uh, which doesn't make it a pretty uh, particularly representative pool of adjudicators. And so they were telling me about some of the initiatives they have. They've been working with law firms, talking about, you know, we've also talked about the rise in the income partner or of counsel, like where they're, they're trying to hide, especially now that it's less of counsel and using this income partner where they, hide the diverse promotions as income partners. So on the letterhead, it looks like a partner, but they don't treat them that way, which is a horrible problem that's happening around the industry. And one of the points that they were making is, you know, they work with law firms to try and, especially in those situations to say, hey, you know, you might not have made this person an equity partner because they don't have a book of business, but, you know, there's a stream of revenue they could be bringing in because they are, you know, 15, 16 years out, they are competent enough to be an adjudicator. And like, we will, you know, work with them to get them in that position. Uh, they And working with law schools to just, obviously law school students aren't going to be able to be adjudicators yet, but to, you know, let them know that's a career path you could potentially be going down in 10, 15 years, uh, not have it be something that they don't even think about until the very end. It, it was an interesting philosophical discussion about how we move forward with this area of law. Uh, and it was tech based to the extent that I, I mean, obviously, we've had this for a long time. But it takes, you know, these folks who are coming at it from the perspective of building a digital platform, uh, and their platform is all based around the idea of, you know, it, it was kind of perfectly hand in hand with what was going on with the pandemic. They've got a platform where it can all be handled in, in the one thing. It's secure. All the documents are there and you can have all your hearings and just seamless and secure. And, but it's them coming, people coming at it from the tech angle where, you know, your mind is a little less one foot in the old ways where they said, you know, this, this seems like something we should do something about. And uh, so they're, putting some resources into that. And I thought it was really interesting. That is interesting to me. And I feel like when I've talked to them before, it was more around the idea of geographic diversity, but I think that kind of goes hand in hand, not only with adjudicators, but with law firm, corporate legal department hiring as well. Cause they're one of their main pitches when they were talking to me is even if in you're in New York, can't necessarily find an adjudicator there. Well, if you're on this online platform, get somebody who's very smart, but maybe out of Kansas or maybe yeah. out of Houston or something like that. And they're still going to be able to adjudicate your case because it's online. Um, but kind of inherent in that is 
you have a wider pool that you are hiring from. And it also almost makes hiring diverse people easier because you can draw from X, Y, and Z. So it's not necessarily your small geographic region. Say you're in a portion of the country that isn't very diverse. All your adjudicators are probably going to look like you. In this case, you can draw from somewhere else and try and get that diversity in there. Um, So I, I find that interesting as well. And the fact that they're particularly focusing on it, I think makes sense. Yeah, I, th- I think it's very much tied to the, the, the tech in the way that Zach just described, but also the innovation angle. I, I mean, if if we are going to innovate in, in how we you know deliver justice uh, and if online dispute resolution is going to be a, a key part of that, and everybody seems to think it is, then uh, it's not just a matter of improving the tech around online dispute resolution, but in tr- improving the composition uh, of, of the panels of those people who are providing it, the arbitrators and mediators, so that they are more reflective of the world we live in uh, and have the kinds of uh, cult- cultural uh, and, and social kinds of sensitivities, uh, not, not just legal savvy or business savvy or something like that. Uh, I mean, this is a very real issue. I'm on a I'm on a board of directors of a local, like a community mediation group up up where I live, and uh, we're very much kind of preoccupied with this issue because we're finding it very hard to create. We, we do a lot of community mediation uh, work or, or or like very low level court mediation work, but uh, our even there our panels tend to be old white guys or old white guys and women, but they tend to often be end of career people who've retired or doing something else. And, you know, are doing this is just doing this uh, as a as something to uh, as a way to kind of give back in, in their later years. Uh, and, and it's hard to uh, pr- pull people onto these panels who reflect the, the communities and the cultures that that we're actually mediating around. Uh, and it's and it can be hard to uh, Train a bunch of old white guys to have old white guys to have that kind of cultural sensitivity that that's needed for that. Um, so you know it, it's a, it's a very important issue if if mediation and arbitration are going to continue to be uh, uh, you know uh, strong alternatives in terms of driving access to justice. I think. Well, and to pick up on one of the things that that Joe said about the the uh, innovation coming from the tech angle. I wonder really if it isn't more innovation from the younger generation. I mean, I've seen it in some of the institutions like ILTA and Boy Scouts that I'm involved with, where you know the younger generation doesn't want to know how something's done. They want to know what the end result is, and they will get there on their own. So I think by default, almost Joe, that the the uh, what's the word I want? The copying of the old way of doing it, the following of the line of its A and B and C, people are willing to go the heck with us to go right from A to Z, uh, forget everything in between. And I think that's something that uh, uh, a lot of us are going to have to get used to uh, in in trying to facilitate that kind of, uh, you know, get out of my way and just tell me what the end result is that you want. Yeah. Um, All right. Anything more on that? Uh, If not, Zach, your turn. Yeah, um, so my story is actually a little bit of an old story. Uh, Two weeks ago today, there was a bipartisan data privacy bill uh, federally that was pushed forth. Um, Supposedly, they said, you know, we fixed some of the past complaints that people have had with federal data privacy bills. So this one, hypothetically, would be easier to pass and actually may come to pass. Um, Kind of in the time since, uh, just being where we are at ALM, I, I got a lot of emails saying, hey, this is a thing. Like, let talk to XYZ about what the implications are. And I just internally kind of said, eh, pump the brakes on this because we've seen federal data privacy bills before and they go up in flames rather quickly when it comes to brass tacks and some of the details. Um, So actually kind of out of that, we published an article today, basically just taking a look at what some of the roadblocks to a federal privacy bill are. And there still are a lot of those details to work out. Um, Some of the big ones being uh, exemptions to the bill 
Like it's written in the draft right now that Illinois biometric law kind of supersedes anything that it's doing some elements of CPRA as well. If there are other state bills that are coming down the pike, which probably are happening because Connecticut just passed one of their own and more states are c- Mass- considering Massachusetts it. Massachusetts is likely to have one before. Yeah. The, so how does that interact with something like this? Um, there's also the question about just how supersized it's going to make the FTC essentially, because it has something in there about having an entire privacy bureau, which would make FTC just huge in comparison to other uh, federal agencies. So there's still a lot to discuss with this. Um, Very smart people that we've talked to says this does have a few more legs than maybe some of the ones like in 2019 or in the past, but um, it's going to be interesting to watch whether they actually can get this somewhat over the finish line, just because it seems like privacy is something that people on both sides of the aisle do want. And it has been both uh, blue states and red states that have passed state bills. But what exactly those bills are when they come out and whether people can agree on a federal one, um, there's I still have a lot of questions about whether they're going to be able to do so. Zach, I thought I, it was a great article. I thank you for writing that. I thought one of the interesting things was the provision in which they want um, consumers to have to agree to every kind of um, use of their data. So you would independently do biometric or personal. And and, and the, whoever, I can't remember who you quoted, but they said, you don't want shopping on Amazon to feel like you're signing a mortgage, you know, which I thought was hilarious. Is like, how difficult are you going to make simple consumer transactions? Which made me wonder, whether it would be easier to attach privacy profiles to people and you just have, you set your own defaults and any company you interact with has to comply with your defaults. Now, I know that would be tough to implement, but it might be easier than than signing mortgage paperwork every time you want to buy a pair of shoes. (laughs) That is really interesting. I like that idea. I guess the question would then come in like you could do that once for Amazon and you're good but would there be data does that like inherently data sharing between companies to share your preferences even? or maybe it's the FTC you file it with the FTC just the way you have a registry of do not call it's like it's like protect my data that's the protect my data registry and we right. all know how well the do not I call know works. I know <laughs> right, right. a lot of things are slipping through lately blockchain Horace says blockchain We'll do it on blockchain. Oh, okay. See, so so I, I got to throw this out. I'm still stuck when it comes to blockchain on jurisdictional issues, right? There's what, six, seven states in the United States that recognize either blockchain by name or by nebulous kind of definition of, of the technology. I, I'm really still kind of stuck on how you enforce anything nationally let alone internationally, uh, that, that's blockchain. I mean, there's a lot of really, really great functions for blockchain uh, and a lot of instances in which, you know, they're trying to make a use for the technology, uh, which is, you know, not the way to, to that's the cart before the horse. But um, like I said, I, I still have issues with, uh, as I said, last time I checked, there's, there's I know, a handful of of states where it's recognized, period. So your your purpose and function of uh, all the smart contracts and all these things that <laughs> admittedly are amazing potentials. Um, again, where where do you get your enforcement capabilities? Uh, well, isn't isn't one of the ways to do that is through kind of a the 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 private. Uh private cloud, private blockchain approach of, of a, a group of organizations coming together and agreeing to a set of rules that will govern their use of blockchain and they're having their own sort of internal, uh, you know, uh, procedures and rules around how it gets enforced and what happens in the event of a breach or something and like I'm that. I'm forgetting the name of the law firm that has a consortium. I think it's in the real estate side. Uh, Sugar, I just heard him speak on the subject and I'm drawing a total blank. Is it yeah. DLA? Um, I don't know. Hang on a second here. Let me go to the side yeah. screen here. And- yeah. But I, I mean, I think that's an interesting, somebody says Oric too, maybe. But I think that's also an interesting issue with regard to these privacy laws. I think it, 
uh, Zach, your, your or not your uh, issues uh, article talks about the preemption issue. But again, I, I know here in Massachusetts, there's been a, a very hotly debated uh, privacy bill going around that, uh, again, in my own work as a lobbyist here, I've been involved in a little bit. But uh, the the biggest issue uh, that a lot of the uh, a lot of those a lot a lot of the big companies that would be regulated by this privacy bill their biggest concern is not that there's going to be a privacy bill it's that there are a gazillion privacy bills out there and they just want one set of rules they don't want to have to figure out what do i have to do in california and what do i have to do in massachusetts and what do i have to do in whatever state so it'd be interesting if if there is a federal privacy law um you know does that then preempt uh, all these state laws and become the one law that governs it's Hogan level and it's uh, their product is drive train or excuse me. Yeah. Drive chain chain. Oh. Excuse me. Hmm. Huh. And again, fascinating in that, you know, the way they're using it. Uh, and I don't mean to turn this into a discussion of that. You know, the actual documents are not part of the drop blockchain, just the um, hashes of the documents so that you've got proof that the document is unaltered. Uh, and, right. and like I said, they, they they very cleverly got around a lot of the what I would consider to be jurisdictional issues huh. uh, by how they implemented. But yeah. fascinating, uh, fascinating stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Zach, any any uh, further thoughts on that preemption issue or? Uh... Oh, um, it, not particularly. I mean, no. when the uh, attorney that we talked to for that basically said that you're just opening yourself to class action after class action if <laughs> something yeah, like that yeah, happens right. because yeah. when you have the conflicting laws it's just it there's going to be a lot of litigation i think no matter how this shakes out just because privacy there is a lot of questions and even when you get into things about like internet of things and where exactly the data that you're holding stops and um how it's being manipulated even within algorithms there's there's a lot to it that i think is yet to shake out and um one other point that this article made too is there are a lot of these state laws but actually the federal law didn't really draw from any of them in how it was um in how it was drafted it was just kind of its own thing so it's kind of curious as to why they didn't draw inspiration from something like cpra or even the virginia and colorado bills um so where those differ i think some devil will be in the details too yeah all right uh so uh once i had a couple of stories this week and i wasn't sure Sure, what to talk about, but actually, I think one I might talk about is actually just kind of a follow up from what we we're talking about last week with the law pay acquisition of uh, of my case, uh, which is a, a a story that continues to have legs, as they say. Uh, but I, I did a, a follow up uh, talking to uh, three CEOs of other practice management companies to kind of get their impressions of it. I talked to Jack Newton of C of, of uh, CEO of Clio. Uh, Sumia Natimi of uh, Paradigm and Kelly Castell of Profit Solve, uh, and uh, uh, you know, I, I think, not surprisingly, I think basically they all said some similar things. I mean, one is is that uh, you know none of them were all that surprised by the deal because payments. Is, is sort of become table stakes for practice management or practice management has become table stakes for payment, whichever way you kind of spin that. But one way or the other, uh, you know, you've got to have that, the, the, you need to have both of those components. Uh, and, uh, you know, I kind of asked them all, and I've actually talked to a number of others off the record who didn't want to go on the record this week, but, um, you know, kind of said to some of them, well, you know, you're, you integrate with law pay. Does this, concern you at all? Are you going to continue to be a partner with LawPay now that they own your competitor? Uh, how does that work? Uh, and, you know, they pretty much all said, oh, you know, we've got a great relationship with LawPay and we'll want to continue to offer it to our customers and our customers like it. And so therefore we'll continue in that way. Uh, I, I thought Jack, Jack Newton's comments were particularly interesting because Jack uh, 
I won't say he quite takes credit for the deal, <laughs> but uh, he does kind of make the point that he feels that once Clio launched its own payments, uh, keeping feature, up with the Joneses feature that well, that, well, that it didn't leave law pay a whole lot of uh, options at that point, because uh, he said that uh, Clio had been uh, uh, one of you know, law pay, I think he said largest uh, integration partner. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the, I guess the, the raising the question of whether they're, whether an independent pay, payment processor, uh, can continue to survive uh, in, in this market as all of these other products are launching their own payments. I mean, pretty much they all have some version of their own payments, whether they're doing it, uh, through, you know, sort of, uh, uh, not so transparently through another payment processor where they've actually developed their own payment processing technology. But, uh, uh, you know, law pay was kind of the first on the market. It came along, uh, and, and, you know, uh, as I said to the law pay CEO last week, they were this is kind of Switzerland, uh, 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 as we talked on this panel, but, uh, they aren't Switzerland anymore. And, uh, I, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's an interesting it's an interesting move. I mean, I guess the question is, did LaPay do it because they had to, or did they do it uh, because it was the right thing to do? I think it's a little bit of a combination of both is, is the answer, but uh, I thought it was interesting to get the perspectives of the other CEOs on this. Yeah, one thing that was interesting, Isha did a follow-up to kind of talking more to the consultant side about what they saw that was interesting. And Brett Bernie made the point that um, I mean, we've talked a lot about what legal technology has drawn from other technology verticals. And he made the point, well, this uh, you could read this as fintech, financial technology, seeing legal tech as a potential growth area as well. And obviously, law pay, a finna pay is very entrenched in the legal vertical, but they are a fintech company. They're financial technology inherently in what they do. And especially with the, like, I wouldn't necessarily call it far ahead where fintech is ahead of legal tech right now, but I think most people have said for a while that legal tech right now is where fintech was maybe five, 10 years ago. And I wouldn't necessarily call it surprising for fintech companies to see that and say, hey, this could be a potential growth area for us if there are some adjacent technologies like a practice management. Um, so not necessarily about this deal, but what it portends down the road is, could we see more major combinations of legal technology companies and just other software verticals? Yeah, makes sense. Um, I know a couple of you had a couple of other stories. Anything else jumping out that you'd like to uh, talk about? Gene, you had some other stuff. Anything you want to well, talk about? I thought, that, well, building on um, this discussion, there was the story in um, Artificial Lawyer about questioning whether legal tech is facing VC funding crunch. And they said that there was a dramatic drop from 90 uh, fundings to 36 uh, in Q2 of 22. But obviously, no one knows about the, the opportunities in financial, in legal fintech. But you know, it just said you know, basically, it said it, it speculates a lot on what kind of companies are likely to get funding, and it concludes, I think, that larger companies are likely to continue to get funding. People might try and minimize their losses and not do follow-up funding for smaller companies. So it just talked about the whole, you know, that they're you know, while the whole economy is facing a lot of uncertainty, whatever happens, the larger, uh, you know, uh, venture capital market is going to happen in legal tech. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of to that end, another story from this week that um, I know you covered too, Bob, was the legal tech fund announced their $28.5 million raise. And when we talked to them, uh, Zach Posner kind of made that point too of, you know, we're staring down the barrel of a recession right now. <laughs> so what does that look like for legal technology funding? And people are probably going to have to tighten belts somewhere. Um, he speculated it might even be a little bit of the opposite, where if you are looking for a big risk, 
you're maybe taking a chance on some of those smaller companies that have much larger X payouts versus something that would take a hundred million to try and invest in, but wouldn't necessarily have the same ceiling um, just because you don't necessarily have a hundred million to invest anymore. So um, it, it'll be interesting to see what strategies people take, but yeah, I've definitely heard that both on and off the record of, VCs that maybe we saw even six months ago at Legal Week were all over the place looking for who to invest in. We might not be seeing that as much as we get to the end of 2022. Yeah, and yeah, they actually they, closed that raise back in October, right? Is there something they, they're talking about it now, but they actually completed it in October. So the other thing they noted was the 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 collapse of the IPOs. Like they said, Legal Zoom was down 67 percent, which is which I didn't know. That's pretty shocking. Yep. Uh, yeah. All right. Um, let's see. I, uh, what, I guess one other story I might just mention only because uh, it, it was different than stuff I, I a lot of the legal tech stuff I, I tend to write about, which was this company called uh, Image Rights, which launched a product this week. Uh, for I, they, the company's been around since two thousand and nine, uh, and they just kind of made their first foray into. Uh, into legal tech. And it is one of those things where it kind of happened through uh, opportunistic, opportunistically, that's not the right word, maybe, but 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 uh, they they began, you know, to hear from law firms that uh, law firms wished they had a version of what they do for them to use. And uh, they finally listened and said, Okay, we'll we'll roll that out. But what they what they do actually is they just they, they started as a, a platform to protect visual artists, and they have a very powerful uh, visual search engine that uh, goes out and searches the web for copies of, of uh, photographs and paintings and, and, and that sort of thing. Uh, and uh, up until recently, the platform has been really focused on uh, on the artists themselves using it. Artists can come and just kind of upload their portfolio and, and this site just constantly goes out and monitors the web for, for copies. And it's, it's, you know, they gave me a demo of, I mean, it's, it's seems really powerful. I mean, you can find, you know, where, where the where a photo has been modified or, or built into a uh, built into a collage or, or any number of other uses. Um, and uh, but they at some point started a service where they built up a network of lawyers to match once one of these artists discovered their copyrights were being infringed, they could match them to a lawyer. Uh, and then eventually the lawyers started kind of getting onto the platform themselves and saying, well, gee, we wish we could have this to handle our own cases and our own clients. And so that's what they rolled out this week is basically just a, it's a platform for uh, basically for copyright lawyers primarily to be able to go on and, and uh, uh, manage their, their clients' uh, visual portfolios and, and keep track of potential uh, uh violations of their copyright and and where they where there are images that uh, appear to be violations of copyright they can then uh, create the uh, digital file they need to to uh, preserve evidence uh, of that infringement and uh, you know use it uh, however they will so I thought that was kind of interesting yeah um, <clears throat> no that is um, yeah, especially with uh, yeah you know like a the copyright trolls have absolutely needed more help. I feel like the <laughs> the abuse of the system they've been doing for the last 15 years, they really needed that extra. Yeah, no, but it is important uh, in a lot of cases. It's just I deal constantly with these people who are less savory in the industry, shall we say. Um, yeah. But I... I well, You're I mean, talking the about most the people who are out there just trying to make a buck by enforcing the copyright on these things, make a quick buck. Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, and and some of it's really egregious. Uh, we had at where you know at above the law, and obviously this came of nothing because it was nothing. But uh, if we were less savvy, we might have ended up losing money over it. Uh, these people who put they buy the rights from the photographers, and then they put the image on Getty, Shutterstock, iStock, and one of those things. And then they pull it off of there. And you know, if you got it while it was on there, you have a license to it, whatever. But then they just bombard everybody who gets it in the future saying, pay us. And we uh -huh. have receipts of, yeah, we got it when it was on the subscription, but they bank on people not having that. It's really, really awful. Yeah. Yeah. 
Hey, right. I'll say I'll yeah. I'll say one thing. Like, you know, since we have a little bit uh, that's tangentially legally related, uh, you know, <laughs> depositions and video depositions and how you sync those and put them together on the fly, and uh, that used to be such a difficult process when I was practicing. But now, you know, we've got these. I, I know that like Everlaw has like a super easy way of syncing AV uh, uh, testimony, and whatever. And I got to be honest, I, like. The, earlier this week, uh, Bill Stepien, the Trump campaign manager, uh, his wife went into labor, so he wasn't able to show up for the hearing. So they, on the fly, had to insert video deposition clips to get across what he was otherwise going to testify for. And they said, oh, well, the staff is, it's slightly delayed this morning because the staff has got to get to rework their image stuff. And then it wasn't delayed much more than like five minutes and they had everything in there. And all I could think was, yeah, this is, this is modern legal practice. These folks are able to take videotape depositions, immediately jump to the clips they need, throw them into an integrated presentation and pop it back out in five minutes. I was at you like, it's, it's a high profile version of some of the same tech that we all deal with all the time. Practicing wise. I assume they did not pinch and zoom into any of the images <laughs> right 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 yeah i guess it, so far i don't think they've had to pinch okay good good all right any, anything else jeff anything else you want to throw in there not this week Bob. all right well we can let everybody uh get started even earlier on their weekend then uh, even though joe already started his weekend but the rest of us can get started in the this is always the beginning of my weekend like this that. show is like always that. when I feel like my beginning, my weekend has begun. I usually have a standing meeting right after this show every week. So it's like my weekend is never really <sighs> quite starting until after that meeting. But I don't have it today. So okay. I'm out of here. All right. Thanks, everybody. See Good you next week. Everyone. Have a good weekend. Have a great good weekend. Week.